Uh, William Callahan, I was a federal prosecutor then assigned to the White House Office of Drug Abuse Law Enforcement. And that was a presidential office set up by President Nixon. And uh, I still get information, oddly enough, from uh, former agents and people like Jerry Miller that his cocaine abuse caught up with him and uh, he had developed a weak heart. I had heard rumors that he went to Texas and had a heart bypass, and that's more recent. All of the agents who work on the case to this day believe he's still alive. And I guess uh, in 72, I became involved when Special Agent Jerry Miller and Detective Roger Garay came to our office to break some bread with us and talk about a case they had called the Frank Matthews case. At the time, I knew nothing about Frank Matthews. Uh, we, when I say we, myself, my supervisors and fellow prosecutors thought there was a very good case percolating here. What were the challenges? One group of 12 investigators, and he was feeling the heat. He was turning up amazing intelligence and his 12 agents were working overtime. Following Matthews, they had a wiretap going and I heard enough to know that we're not dealing here with an ordinary Brooklyn-based uh, drug operation. It's very huge. Miami, Baltimore, Philadelphia, and Atlanta, similar information was coming back. Some guy named Matthews was behind the local organizations in those cities. Well, we immediately opened a grand jury investigation. Maybe a thousand subpoenas going out to drug dealers, drug addicts all over New York, Baltimore, Philadelphia, Atlanta, and Miami. And then uh, Agent Miller uh, recommended a, a central tactical unit be formed. He came to me with the idea. This had the earmarks of a huge organization. We, we interviewed some informants. We, we rushed through an indictment, uh, the first indictment before the superseding indictments, and we had Matthews indicted, along with Beckwith and a few others. They had information that Matthews was going out to Las Vegas to both launder money and attend the... Uh, uh, the Super Bowl that year. Uh, he was arrested in um, Las Vegas by local DEA agents and the city police. And Miller and I flew out immediately to question him. And we interviewed him, but he stonewalled us completely. He did indicate that he didn't want to talk to white prosecutors or white agents. And uh, we spoke to Marshal Butler, then the U.S. Marshal for Brooklyn a black marshal, and he flew out to meet us. Marshal Butler went in and spoke to him alone, and Frank opened up to him that he was tired of paying extra, huge amounts of money to the La Cosa Nostra and a group of Jewish businessmen in Brooklyn who were distributing heroin. We were never able to crack who the Jewish businessmen in Brooklyn were, but we had sufficient information that the Bronx uh, mafia guys, the Italians, were giving Matthew smaller and smaller units and overcharging him. He hated that. He wanted to branch out and be his own uh, distributor. And he hated the Italians because they hated the blacks. He was, in his own way, a racist. And he was a homeboy from Durham, North Carolina. He was in a league of his own. And he was a top, not only an organizer, but a businessman. He saw himself as that. He posed as a real estate developer, which was a, a front, but he bought a whole series of parcels of land where he was informed the Federal Highway was going to go in. He, he scooped up those parcels of land. Had that gone through, he would have been a multi, multi-millionaire just on the, on the real estate. But he was determined to cut out the Italian mob in, in the Bronx. He hated them. They also um, were capable of killing him at a moment's notice. He was represented at the time by Gino Galina, a, uh, an attorney who was later assassinated on the streets of New York. Gino tended to represent dope dealers. He was found out after he was murdered. He had a million dollars cash in his law office safe with his one partner. And uh, do I think Matthews had a hand in knocking him off? We're not sure. It was Matthews' money. We're absolutely convinced. 
He stashed his money wherever he could. Well, Matt, uh, Miller and I learned on the, en route uh, of the bail. I mean, we were astounded. I, I, I could not believe a, a federal magistrate in Las Vegas would post a $5 million bond, and all we could think was he knows something we don't know until we get there. In any event, Matthews, when he was arraigned, said, how am I going to pay that? And the IRS agent said, preferably in cash, Mr. Matthews. He took duffel bags of cash to one casino, dropped them on the cashier's tables where they laundered the money for him, and they took 15 to 18 percent for the, for the house. Matthews was a different cat, and uh, he, he landed at this one casino he liked, and they were delighted to take his cash. It was clear from the outset that Frank certainly had a good deal of racism in him. He even called me White T. And uh, we kind of all joked. We got a good laugh at that. Um, but uh, we knew, f just from experience, that La Cosa Nostra and the Italian mob in the Bronx and Staten Island were also racist. Uh, there was no question about it. And Frank, there was no question about his racism uh, ingrained in his system. So he, he would just throw out the word, hey, YT. Uh, Matthews bought a very, very expensive home there. Unfortunately, and I don't think he even knew this, Three Fingers Brown lived across the street, and Paul Castellano lived right down the street a bit. So he had two very angry Italian mafia chieftains uh, looking at his lavish outdoor parties, noisy parties every night. And these, these La Cosa Nostra guys were bosses, and they kept very, very low profiles. And here's Matthew showing up in his usual uh, Rolls Royce, and uh, pimp mobiles would show up, parties in the back, noisy parties at night, all kinds of things going on. Castellano and certainly Three Fingers Brown uh, would have wanted him killed. In fact, the intelligence was pouring in surreptitiously from somebody on that street uh, giving uh, the DEA guys license plate data of every license plate that showed up at the Matthews house. We did not know who really turned that in. I think maybe the agents knew, but I certainly didn't. He knew after they bought the house it wasn't the place he should be. He was the only black fella living on that street. Actually, Marshall Butler came back on the plane with him when he made some admissions to Butler as to uh, his source of heroin was a Jewish, a white Jewish organization in Brooklyn. And uh, the family up in the Bronx was supplying him with his heroin. And he was looking elsewhere. He wanted to branch out on his own and get his heroin directly from Marseille. He, the reason he really fled was when he came back, he was released on amazing bail of 350000 He had to show up weekly at the federal courthouse, and one day as he arrived, uh, Chief of Criminal Division Ray Deary, now a federal judge, Matthew said to him as Deary was going out for lunch, Mr. Mr. Deary, am I going to get that life count I keep hearing about? And he said, you may, Frank. It's very possible. Kind of joking. And he fled that evening. Um, Actually saw him, he, he, after the Deary incident, he, he fled that night, and the last person to see him in Brooklyn was Detective Mike Bramble, who spotted him blasting through a red light in his car. Bramble gave chase, and he lost him. Good. He's I read this in an article. Uh, there was no truth to any rumors that he was a CIA informant or an agent of any type. We, uh, we had indicted Frank, and our indictment included uh, about 20 foreign defendants, and uh, including some customs, Colomb uh, Venezuelan customs agents, and Jules Serini, the courier who came from Marseille with 22 kilos of heroin in his luggage to uh, Caracas. Serini had been told that the bribes were paid and he'd have no trouble coming into Caracas with his suitcases. He was, in fact, arrested with 22 kilos and three suitcases. We got ready for the indictment. We presented it to Washington to be approved, and there was an immediate hole put on it. And uh, M Miller and I were requested to 
uh, report to the criminal division immediately for a meeting with the CIA. And the general counsel told us under no circumstances is your indictment going to be presented as it is. We are lopping off the entire Venezuelan portion, the international portion of your indictment. But there are international ramifications as to things we're doing in Venezuela and with the Russians that we can't talk about. We're aware that his lawyer is Gino Galina, very good criminal lawyer. We do not want a swift, slick lawyer raising motions for any and all wiretaps anywhere in the world. That kind of omnibus motion would cause you and us major problems. We could not, under national security, respond to that, and you will have your indictment dismissed in federal court. Need I say more? And we said, we understand, and they said, have a nice day. So, um, everything closed in on them, and for all we knew, the death threats were multiplying, and Galena was uh, secreting his money. So the comment by Deary may or may not have had an effect. We, we were prepared to bring the life count uh, in, in a superseding indictment. We were getting ready to do that. Well, we, the intelligence picked up that he and, uh, he and Cheryl Brown fled immediately probably that same night when Bramble saw him. They flew to Texas, I think it was Houston, and that was the last sighting uh, of him, at least in this country. I'm told much later he was spotted in um, Nassau, Bahamas. He has been spotted supposedly in parts of Africa. Uh, where he is today, uh, God only knows. I was tell this, his body never turned up. Cheryl Brown's body never turned up. No bones were ever located. It's very, very unusual in cold case homicide cases where a body never turns up. He's, very, he's covered his path very well. Um, he didn't want the homes to be taken of his aunt in Durham. A, uh, a mysterious delivery of a briefcase with all the cash necessary to meet the bond requirements was delivered to the, to the insurance agency in Great Neck, New York, and they took it gladly. We ran a major grand jury investigation on that very issue. 21 years to catch Whitey Bulger and his girlfriend. And here he is in the open living in Santa Monica, California. And everybody believed he was somewhere else. Matthews is now a lot, a lot longer. But his facial features will have changed with age and her facial features. And Bulger was out in public going to Las Vegas casinos. We knew he was in Spain. I think that's Matthew's saving grace, his age, and no one knows what he looks like. His, his major cocaine abuse did major damage, and he had heart palpitations, and uh, there was more than rumor that he had a heart transplant in Houston, possibly Dr. DeBakey, but I don't think so, one of his acolytes, and that he had a successful uh, transplant. Uh, it's like the story that he, he started the... Uh, Heroin in the cadavers coming out of uh, Vietnam. We never could prove that. We don't believe that's true. Well, what happened to him? I believe personally he's in the Caribbean. Uh, he had been in Africa, in the west coast of Africa. Uh, I personally believe he's in Caribbean where they speak English. And I don't think he's back in the drug trade. He has enough cash squirreled away to live a very comfortable life. Well, like the Bulger case, no, none of the agents ever thought he would get away with it. They always thought and believed he'll be found. We firmly believe Matthews will be located, dead or alive, somewhere in the world. It's just a matter of time. Bulger was a, Bulger was a thug and uh, was not a brilliant businessman. Matthews was a pioneering giant in the field of uh, distribution of heroin. It, you know, early on, he caught on that he was being ripped off by the mafia. And he said, hell, I'm going to get my own heroin. And he reached out to uh, Gonzalez who through the organization had Sereni the courier from Marseille bring in 22 kilos of 100% pure heroin. Uh, Matthews paid cash for it, and they would have had backed up 22 kilos every month if they got away with it. He underwent the water bath, not the CIA water bath, but a much more brutal one, where they dumped his head in a, in a laundry cart, held him under for 30 seconds, brought him up, told him either he confesses or the next one is 60 seconds, brought him up, and the next one will be 90 seconds. Serini confessed after the first 
20 seconds bruised. And uh, everything he told us, which was significant, uh, was totally involuntary and could not be used in our federal case. In 70, 71, heroin was endemic. Entire blocks in Brooklyn, the entire apartment houses were addicted and small $10 packages of heroin was, was being used, not methadone, but, but heroin. And President Nixon was furious. We were coming up for the re-election in September of uh, 72 would have been his re-election. This is right before Watergate. The president called all, all of us down to uh, the White House for a meeting on his drug abuse plan. He was livid with rage when I told him what was going on in Brooklyn. And, uh, but the violence in Brooklyn at the time, murders in Philadelphia and Darby's section, and they cut a drug dealer's head off and put his head on the uh, outside window rail of a, a bar where drug, drug deals hung out. Did he pull the trigger? No. Did violence bother him? Not at all. And uh, he had underlings like Beckwith and Pop Darby and a lot of other people could have easily whacked anybody they wanted to, and they did, of course. We know that. But Matthews himself um, was kind of a star in his own right, and uh, you couldn't really associate him with pulling the trigger or shoving a knife at somebody. He, he had a niche business in that he supplied the, uh, the mixing for the heroin uh, and he had access to glassine envelopes and millions and millions of ounces of manite from Italy. <clears throat> that became a nice little business for Rosenbaum until we picked him up, questioned him at the hospital where he was undergoing heart treatment, and he made a full confession on Christmas Eve. He was Matthew's white supplier of the ingredients, the glassine envelopes and the manite, which they mix heroin with. But there's been a lot of recent movies on Lucas being the king of drugs. That's not true. And Matthews was the number one heroin uh, pioneer at the time. Had he not been, his wings not been clipped in 72, he would have ruled the United States. He would have branched out to California without question. Now you have the Mexican gangs. But Matthews in his day was the number one guy. No question about it. What if I told you that the illegal drug business wouldn't be possible without the American government? Treason against the American people committed by Central Intelligence. For a meeting with the CIA, and you will have your indictment dismissed in federal court. The U.S. government cut deals and bestowed favors on brutal dictators, malevolent generals, and murderous gangsters in every corner of the globe. You're getting emotional again. <sighs> you might think it was just a conspiracy theory. You'd be wrong. Drugs were in the black community. Nobody really cared. All the heroin was coming from Italian sources. Jewish, too. The African-American community has quite a debt to what we would consider a criminal enterprise. You know, only poor people got the time to make moral judgment. This is black organized crime. Yes. Yes. You might think that Timothy Leary's quote to tune in, turn on, and drop out with LSD was meant to change America. Do you have the feeling of reality when you look at this paper and you hold the pencil in your hand? No, yes. But what if LSD was really part of a secret U.S. government mind control program? Turns out that it was. I give the CIA a total credit for sponsoring and initiating the entire consciousness movement of the 1960s. Early 65, I decided that I really wanted to make a lot of LSD and give it away. International drug trafficking was subordinate to the national security interests of the United States. American dope. For the first time, the real story of the global drug trade told by the undercover agents, kingpins, and prosecutors who were there at the very heart of darkness.